This is a time machine. Now, not in the traditional sense, but it does allow any old computer to connect to it and browse the web like it is in the date that you set. It came with the modem. That's a little bonus, not that I'm gonna use it, but. Now I'm not talking about getting old computers back online to the modern web. What I'm talking about is any old computer with a modem can dial up directly to this device without the need of a telephone network. We have a Commodore 1570 1200 baud modem. I don't have a landline. Yeah, there's not really much use for that. And browse the web and see web pages from the year that you set. Now there's a lot of really cool technology to make this work and we're gonna go through all of it. Being an old computer enthusiast, I really wanted to experience the dial-up internet like it was back in the day, and without the need of spending a bunch of money trying to set up my own telephone network in my house. And we have a modem here, which who cares? <laughs> I'll probably take that out. So I came up with this, miniaturized all of it, put it into this package, and here we are. Now, whether you're a maker, a tinkerer, or just love old computers or seeing things how electronics are built, I think this video has got a little bit for everybody. Before we get going, I want to thank this video sponsor, PCBWay. They offer PCBs as well as sheet metal fabrication and CNC machining, all of which they've provided for this project. Head to PCBWay.com for more. All right, now, with that out of the way, let's go build the thing. The first thing that we need to do is find a power supply. This one is from Mark Smith from Surf and Circuits. And the good news about this one is it was designed to have five volt rail in order to power any kind of device that you need. For us, it'll be the Raspberry Pi and 170 volts to power the Nixie tubes. So this is perfect for us. It's also open hardware, so I'll be able to integrate it directly into our circuit design. An important part of designing anything is prototyping. I'm creating these custom cables that I can use to hook up the Nixie tubes onto a breadboard. This way I can test the circuits in isolation before laying anything out in a PCB designer or, or schematic or anything like that. Nixies work in a really interesting way. Basically, you hook 170 volts up to a specific electrode on the back of the tube. Depending on which one you touch, you get a different number on the electrode that glows inside. This thing is gonna require a lot of compute, so I opted for a Raspberry Pi Zero W2. It's got enough I.O. for me to control the Nixie tubes and the control knob so you can select the date and all the software packages it's gonna to need to control this thing. Now the Pi doesn't have enough I.O. in order to talk to all of the tubes at the same time, so we use these shift registers for what's called multiplexing. Essentially, the Raspberry Pi tells it some information, and it's this chip's job in order to farm it out to multiple tubes and multiple chips down the line. These are driver ICs. The shift registers send these a binary number, and these are responsible for displaying the digit on the tube itself. Now, eventually, we're gonna need four of these ICs, one for each Nixie tube, that are powered by two shift registers. I'm only doing one and one right now to make sure that everything works as expected, and then we'll expand it later. With the components connected, I just need to add the power. I'm adding two resistors here that equal about 15,000 ohms to control the current. I'll add a single resistor in the final design, but this is what I had on hand. With everything connected, it's time to test. When we power up the Pi, we immediately see a zero show up on the Nixie tube. This is a good sign because the shift register should be cleared out, and so it should be telling the Nixie driver that there's no data or to show a zero. In order to actually control the number, I'll need to write a Python script. I'm using a Nixie library written by Scott Baker in 2013 that allows me to communicate to the shift register and the tubes themselves through the Raspberry Pi's GPIO. This is gonna be really simple. I'm only gonna display a digit that I'm setting as an environment variable, but later on, I'll wanna control it myself uh, through the use of a rotary input knob. I'm logged into the Raspberry Pi itself, and I'm setting the environment variable I'm looking for to a 6. So when I run the script and all goes well, hopefully I should see a 6 pop up on the Nixie tube. It looks like that works, so now we can move on to input. 
I selected this rotary input knob because it's pretty straightforward and I can hook it up directly to the Raspberry Pi. Eventually, I'm only going to want to loop through a specific number of years so that we don't have anybody trying to browse the internet in the future. For now, I'll update the script to loop through. If it hits 9, goes back to 0. If you go down past 0, goes back to 9. You get the idea. With all the electronics working in the bench test, it's time to move on to schematics. Now, for a really, really simple PCB, I'll admit it, sometimes I'll just jump into the board designer, but for something that's more complicated, you absolutely have to design the schematic first. Now, when you're thinking about designing a schematic, it's really about following all of the rules, making sure all of your inputs are connected to the right outputs and that everything scales properly. I'll show this later, but once you're done with that, you can export your schematic to the PCB designer, and the PCB designer will make sure that you adhere to all of the rules that you've defined in your schematic. Honestly, it's one of the most fun things for me, but uh, it can get pretty tedious. I'll start with the very, very simple components, and then I'll expand it into more. In order to keep myself sane, I generally have to jump back and forth between the different creative processes of a project like this, so I think it's a good idea for me to dive into the design of the case itself. Now, it's not really a case, it's not really an enclosure, it's more of a structure that I'm going to put these boards in to be able to use, but I opened up Shaper 3D, which is the program that I like to start working in. I start with basic shapes, right? Squares, rectangles, uh, dimensions, things like that, to get the idea of how big I need the boards to be, how big I need the case to be, and then really start playing around with the, uh, the design and the look and feel. When you start out with basic shapes, it's a lot easier to add curves, to remove objects, to add in different details from there. This case is going to be super straightforward because I want to be able to manufacture it or print it or have it made uh, very easily and very cheaply. So I'm thinking of being able to do the thing out of a single plate of material. Uh, I'd like to do brass, um, maybe I'd like to do acrylic, so I can actually screw in some standoffs into this case and then have one side of it, the PCB design, that is for the the power supply, the controller, things like that, and then have the other side of it, the, the second PCB, which is going to be the Nixie tube display and the control input knob. So keeping that in mind, I want to keep things simple. I want to keep the boards relatively the same size. I'm going to have a ribbon cable connecting the two so I don't have to think about another way how to do this or design it all on one big board. And I've, I've got all of this in my head when I'm really thinking through the design process here. I'll go through multiple iterations of this back and forth, trying to figure out where tolerances are, how to tweak things. I want to make sure the board is, is quite a bit further up off of the material because it's going to be conductive or it might be conductive and I'm, I've got it in my head about what I'm what I'm trying to accomplish here when I'm designing something with what I call a known component or something that actually exists out in the world and I'm not making it it's always a good idea to find a dimensional accurate model that way I can import it into Shaper and I can use it in order to, to get some really precise things like make sure the holes are the right size, things like that. I do this with standoffs, I do this with screws. If you go to McMaster Car, for example, they have a 3D model of every single one of their tiny little screws, every component, so you can bring that into your 3D program to make sure that you've got the right dimensions off of everything. A lot of times you're just not going to be able to find a 3D model of something that you're going to want to include in your design, so this is the point where a really good pair of calipers does the trick. Now, when you're measuring something like this, take the same approach as you do in your design. Measure the large blocks first. Measure the, the major shapes first. Is it a square? Is it a rectangle? How thick is it? How wide is it? Then get into the details. What's the radius of the corner? Are there cutouts? Are there threads? And sometimes you don't care about those things. Like for example here, I'm not going to be screwing this rotary knob into anything, so I don't care about the threads, but I want to make sure that where I'm measuring is to the outside of the threads to make sure that it fits within my design. So again, invest in a really good pair of calipers, 
and measure things with the major objects first. Now, you'll notice that I'm not just modeling the outer case itself. I actually have the boards in the case, and I'm doing this for a few different reasons. One is fit testing. I wanna make sure that I know how far away the boards are gonna be from the case or how high up the standoffs need to be in order to support the boards. And I also wanna make sure that I know exactly where those Nixie tubes need to be placed on the board. Because when I go into the PCB design and layout, I need to understand exactly where they are from, a, from an XY perspective on that board. So I'm using my 3D modeling program not just to design the case, I'm also using it to make sure I know where every Everything is going to be laid out in the PCB design. All right, so I think we're in a pretty good spot with the case right here, and I've got all the major components in there. I've even designed a, uh, a top for the rotary knob itself uh, to fit right onto it, and I'm going to have this CNC milled in brass, and hopefully it'll, it'll turn out pretty cool. But before I get that, I'm also going to plan on 3D printing one for testing as well. Here's where we left off with our schematic for the display side of the PCB. All that's left now is to export this into the PCB designer. Now, when you export this, it's not going to lay it out for you, but what it will do is create these tiny blue lines called rat lines. These rat lines aren't traces, but what they are is based on your schematic, they tell you all of the inputs and outputs and where they should go. The PCB designer won't let you connect one input to the wrong output or vice versa. So the goal here is to lay out the PCB and then draw all of the traces you need in order to connect all of those rat lines together. Now, I want to be clear, I'm giving a very high-level overview to something that people spend their careers doing that are far better at this than I am. There are a lot of things that you need to consider when you're making things for manufacturing and not just tinkering around for personal projects. There's a lot that goes into PCB design, and it's not just where you place your components or where your traces are, how long they are, or just making sure everything connects. There's component placement, signal integrity, power distribution, thermal management. All of this culminates into a very, very complex discipline that I only have a very basic understanding of. Earlier on, I mentioned that the power supply was open hardware. What this means is that the creator made the whole thing open source, so I can copy and paste it into my PCB design and layout and just hook up the traces. This saves a huge amount of time. I always look forward to the first shipment coming back because then I really get to see it all mapped out and compact and I really get to start testing things in its entirety. I will admit though, I often have my first version probably a little bit too early. I should do more testing and things like that, but I'm just too excited to get it actually working. The first shipment's in from PCBWay after about a week, and I ordered an initial version of both the control board that contains the power supply and the hookups for the Raspberry Pi, as well as the display board where the Nixie tubes are going to be. Now, I know that I'm probably going to need to make another revision to the PCB for the control board and the Pi, uh, and we'll go into that in a little bit, but I'm really hoping that I won't need to make any further revisions to the display board. So I'll really need to thoroughly test all of them so that that the next order that I make will finally be the last one. PCBs mean components, and this one has a lot of them. The good thing about the power supply is that it's small and compact enough to fit on our board with all the things that we need, but the components get really, really small. Now, usually for something this small, you get a stencil, you'd have solder paste, you'd heat it all up on a hot plate and drop the components on and they kind of melt right into place. I don't have a hot plate, and so I'm going to have to go a little bit old school and flex my soldering skills here.
The power supply took me about an hour and a half to complete, so I didn't film all of it, but I give it a bath and some isopropyl alcohol, tested it, everything seemed to work out great, so I set it aside and started to work on the display PCB. These are shift registers, the surface mount versions of the ones that we used on the prototype board before. Now, a little trick to put these on is tack one leg down first, then you can align it to make sure that it's sitting on the pads correctly and that it's flat to the board. After that, if you use a lot of flux, you can use this drag solder technique. If you did it correctly, then none of the pins will be bridged and the solder will adhere only to the legs and the pads themselves, but always check your work afterwards. Probably the most difficult part of soldering was the pins for the sockets of the Nixie tubes. Now I could have gone at this a couple of different ways. I could have actually bought Nixie tube sockets for the style that I have, but anything Nixie is incredibly expensive and hard to find these days. I honestly don't think they've made these things in about 30 years. I decided to just buy the individual pins, the same ones that we used on the prototype board. The problem is, is getting those to align was going to be incredibly difficult. So what I did is I printed out on my resin printer one of these templates. I did it in resin because the resin is a little bit more tolerant to heat uh, than my regular filament-based printer. But with this template, I'm only tacking down kind of the top and the bottom. After that, I'll try the Nixie tube in there to see if it's lined up correctly to make sure it's straight, kind of horizontally and vertically. Once it's straight, then I'll go ahead and solder in the rest of the pins. But if it's off in any way, I want to make sure that I'm only changing one of the pins and not having to redo all of them because this is pretty tedious work. I've decided to put in sockets for the driver ICs. The reason is, is because these chips are probably just as old as the Nixie tubes. I don't think they've been made in about 30 years. So they have the highest likelihood of being bad in the batch that I bought or going bad in the future. And I don't wanna have to deal with the hassle of desoldering and soldering if I ever need to swap them out. Let's talk modems. Now, you'd think that if you were to plug one modem into another modem, have one modem call and the other one answer, they could talk to each other. Turns out, that's not the case. If you did this, you'd get what's called a no carrier, and that's the modem telling you that it can't detect the telephone network. Now, in order to make this work, other people have built in solutions that literally use old telephone hardware in order to simulate a telephone network. I don't want to do any of that, and so I'm going to have to build that into the PCB design itself. Now, it happens to be easier than you might think. If you've been around long enough and had an old phone system, you know that when the power goes out, the phone still works. This is because the telephone network actually supplies power to the lines. They do this in order to help transmit signals over long distances. Now, Modems know this and detect the current on the lines to know if they're connected to a real telephone network or not. So, the only thing that we need to do in order to trick our modems is supply the right current to the lines. 170 volts will fry pretty much any modem, but we've got 5 volts, and with the right resistor, we can limit the current down to what the modem is expecting. And after looking up some old telephone specs, looks to be between 20 and 40 milliamps. So, after hooking it up to our 5-volt rail and putting in a 200-ohm resistor, looks just about right. With that hooked up, let's try connecting again. It's as simple as that. No crazy equipment or mess of wires, just a little bit of voltage on a line. Now, back when I was ordering the first PCBs, I mentioned that I'm probably gonna have to make some modifications to the control board. 
This is what I was referring to. I was far too impatient the first round to do this test first before making my order, so now I'm going to have to add in that 200 ohm resistor and the 5 volt rail and connect it to the RJ11 jack. Okay, so we just saw how impatience got the better of me. However, in this case, I think it actually turned out to be a positive. Hear me out. PCB Way has been fantastic when it comes to the PCBs. I often get them back in less than a week from the time that I upload them. Now for this project, I also use their sheet metal fabrication and their CNC machining service for the case and the knob. Unfortunately, after a little bit of back and forth with the manufacturing team, that one's been delayed a bit. While I wait for the brass pieces from PCB Way, I had a local manufacturer cut some acrylic for me. Now they couldn't bend it, but that's okay. For this project, I can do it myself. I'm just really excited to get this thing fully assembled, the holes tapped, and everything put together so I can see how it looks. A couple of tips when bending acrylic. Heat it up gradually. Constantly test it. You want it soft enough to bend without cracking, but you don't want it too soft so that it'll warp. Use a hard surface like a jig or the edge of a table in order to get a nice clean bend. Also, you want to let it cool gradually as well. This will help make sure the part doesn't warp when you get your angle right. Last, get more than one sheet. You always want to be able to practice and really get the feel of it before you do it on the final product. I'm really looking forward to the brass one coming, but I gotta say, this acrylic is looking fantastic. I got so excited with how everything's coming together, I completely forgot that because I got the new control boards, I need to re-solder all of those little power supply components all over again. Wish me luck. One thing that always helps when soldering small components, always sort from small to large. Start with your smallest components and go up from there. It'll make getting into tight spaces a lot easier. Start out with your resistors and capacitors and move up to your larger components. There's a couple things you'll notice about my setup. First is the small piece of green tape on the left on my cutting mat. This is so I don't lose track of any components. Now, I should probably use a tray or something like that, but I find that putting it directly on the mat on a flat surface is a lot easier to pick up with the tweezers. The second is my soldering stand. It's better than any helping hands I've ever owned. It's small, it's versatile, you can turn it in any direction to get the right angle. It's called an Omnifixo. I'm not sponsored by them, I just love the thing. I'll leave a link in the description. I always appreciate the time to sharpen my skills, but it's been a lot of soldering. I'm really hoping that these tests pass so I can move on to other stuff. With the last revisions of the board, I added a couple of traces for a power LED, and not just any power LED. This is a time machine, so this is going to be over the top. I found a flexible rope LED that's going to look sick. With all the hardware checks passing, I give it a final bath in the IPA to clean it up, and we're ready for the final phase of the project. Okay, so I lied. We need to talk about one more thing, the modem. Now, unfortunately, this isn't something I was able to design directly onto the PCB, so I found a USB modem that's compatible with the Raspberry Pi. I removed the case, desoldered everything, and I'll be connecting it directly to the board. This 
essentially what I'm doing is the equivalent to connecting a USB modem directly to a Raspberry Pi through the USB port, except in this case, I'm wiring the USB port directly to the PCB and then connecting the wires directly to the Pi. I've also removed the RJ11 jack from the modem. I'm taking the outputs and wiring those directly to the board right before the line voltage inducer circuit we created. This is so when somebody plugs in a phone line into our PCB, it'll already be powered. Now with everything in its final state, we can log into the Raspberry Pi. We'll use a list USB command to make sure the modem shows up. As a final test before assembly, I'll want to make sure that all of the connections are what we expect. Sometimes when you're crimping cables, you can bridge a few or, or screw something up. Because we're working with voltage and high voltage specifically, we don't want to fry anything. We'll do a final check and then we'll finish assembly. With the hardware complete, I made a simple block diagram to explain the systems running on the Pi. All traffic over port 80 coming in from the modem are captured using an IP table configuration. Our controller script not only monitors the input, but also configures how the traffic flows once it's captured by the Pi. Initially, all requests go through Squid. Then, Squid can use ProtoWeb as a direct upstream proxy, or route through an on-device proxy server called Time Travel Proxy that pulls directly from archive.org. Unlike ProtoWeb, which is a hand-curated list of old restored websites, archive.org allows us to pick a date of the site that we want to view. In order to control this, I've selected a special number that tells the Pi to use ProtoWeb. All other dates will pull from archive.org. Every time the input is changed, the controller checks the number. It determines if it needs to update the proxy configuration on Squid, or if it needs to update the date setting on Time Travel Proxy. Let's look at a couple examples. If we set the date to 1996, the controller will update the configuration on Squid to make sure it's using the Time Travel Proxy as its upstream cache. It will then set the configuration of the time travel proxy to use 1996 for any request. Then, when a request comes in from the modem, Squid will route it through the time travel proxy, which will pull the website from archive.org from 1996. Now, if we select our special number, our controller script will instruct Squid to use ProtoWeb as its upstream cache. Then, any request coming in through the modem will be sent straight through and will get returned ProtoWeb's hand-curated version of the website. Simple as that. Well, here it is, the finished product. We finally got in the brass case from PCBWay, and I'll leave it up to you to see which one you like the best, but I think this one looks fantastic. Now, before I leave you with some sweet shots of me surfing the net on my new time machine, I want to thank our sponsor for today's video, PCBWay. And for all of you, thanks for watching.